I will start with that. So we are starting the session on spirituality. Uh, Steve Urquhart. Steve is the founder of the Divine Assembly, the church that's sponsoring this conference today. He's a former state senator, GOP senator, I like to throw in, and a professor at the University of Utah. Uh, Ashley, your last name is uh, pronounced Bracey, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Ashley Bracey. Ashley is an open-hearted mystic. I'm going to ask you to tell me what that is once I'm done. Uh, wired with an unrelenting commitment to spiritual evolution and an immovable curiosity. Ashley reads about 100 books a year and is always looking for new ways to drop into deeper level of understanding and peace. The psychedelic journey has been a large part of her ability to integrate and heal some very traumatic aspects of her childhood, so she's passionate about sharing these beautiful tools and insights with us. Uh, she's an entrepreneur, she's a mother of four amazing children, and she's a numerologist. <laughs> so Ashley, I'm going to let you go ahead, and do you mind starting out with what is an open-hearted mystic, and what is a numerologist? Oh my gosh, well both are kind of one and the same, it's both, both set, uh, sort of tie together uh, in this way that you have this ability to see the magic around you. We have well, for me, a curiosity and an open-hearted willingness to um, see sort of the synchronicities. Numerology is just one of those modalities for me um, where, you know, well, I got, I fell into it basically just trying to make sense of the world around me. And uh, it allowed me to see that there was some order to the chaos everywhere. And so having a mystical uh, perspective or outlook um, gives you sort of, eyes to see that we're we're divinely held and that we're taken care of and there's there's an order to this chaos and that's why i love numerology it's why i love astrology and you know how you do anything is how you do everything so to speak so i'm a mystic because i love mystical you know states of consciousness i love mystical experiences and i live for that i mean that's that's what i live for so yeah. right. thank you i appreciate that yeah Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. This is such an honor and it is absolutely such a, um, such a beautiful conversation that I feel so honored and admittedly very underqualified to be, to be a part of. So I really appreciate it. Um, what's going on with this conference today is so exciting that we're making this type of content less taboo by, by bringing it out into the open and having these conversations together. So I feel blessed and honored to be here. So, so thank you. Well, Steve's spoken really highly about you. So I know he's really excited to have you here and I'm excited to meet you and hear everything you have to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm so I love that I get to show off a lot of my friends today. Um, I'm just so proud of everyone. Everyone's really knocking it out of the park. And so yeah, Ashley and I go back a ways and uh, have shared a lot of great times, but we have never, we're going to talk about spiritual experiences. We have never actually tripped together, but we're working on correcting that very soon. Yes, one of these days. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that we're talking about spirituality too, because pretty much every time we get together, our conversations go to something within that domain. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. And like, you know, everyone was saying on previous conversations um, today in the conference, spirituality is such a, it's such a personal thing, you know, nobody can necessarily define what spiritual, spirituality is. Um, but what I like to think about it, or when I think of spirituality myself, I personally think about it as having this acknowledgement or willingness to have an acknowledgement that there is something divine and even cosmic and uh, bigger than us holding us all together. I mean, we're one little piece of that. And, and so, uh, yeah, for me, uh, spirituality also has a, whoops, sorry about that noise in the background. Um, it has a quality of willingness to it, you know, um, whereas I think religion, I mean, to, not to bring the two into stark contrast here but they are they do contrast each other religion versus spirituality and for me spirituality has a, a quality of willingness to it whereas religion maybe might have a little bit more rigidity um so bringing spirituality into the domain of conversation around uh plant medicine um it's, it's 
such an expansive, expansive lean in because I don't know anyone who's had a plant medicine journey, like Mindy was saying, who hasn't had in some way a spiritual experience, you know? I mean, for me, after you've done enough, having tea with your neighbor is a spiritual experience, you know? Uh, because it sort of opens your heart space, it softens you, it, it gives you eyes to see, you know, like I said, with the willingness to see that we're all so connected and that, that we're all just playing these beautiful roles for each other and you can function from the heart rather than the mind. So, yeah. <laughs> share with us, share with us uh, one of your spiritual experiences, if you will. Oh man, uh, during, I mean, like I said, I, having tea with the neighbors is a, a spiritual experience for me because once your heart is wide open, it's like you, you live that way, you know? But uh, in a plant medicine journey, my gosh. Well, one day I was just microdosing, just a microdose of mushrooms. I happened to have the day by myself and, um, and I brought my hammock in from outside Lay, uh, put it in front of the big window I had and just kind of sat with myself and I had this beautiful uh, awareness I had this memory of myself come up and it was so cool because I hadn't thought of myself as a child in so long you know and there I was just right there in the back of my eyelids little Ashley with the with the mullet and the huge bottle cap glasses <laughs> and uh, just kind of staring back at myself and it was cool because in that moment with my full heart wide open, I sent that little girl love. And I had this just electrical feeling of love being sent from my heart all the way to little Ashley. And then I had this epiphany and I ended up journaling a ton about it. I should have written a poem or something because it was just so moving, but I had this beautiful epiphany that, you know, I've been doing that all along. And, you know, we get weird, science bring science in you know from a quantum physics perspective time isn't linear so that's all happening right now and so here i am sending love to myself as a child saving myself sort of with this this gushy love you know and then doing that um going forward to my future self it's now a practice that i do all the time i just see the power in your heart where you can you know, take that love that's building up, send it back, send it forward. And um, it's a cool tool that I use, whether it's placebo effect or not. I have no idea, but it seems to be working for me. So yeah, yeah. Who cares what the science is behind it? It, it is healing. And so you shared yes. that with me. I think that was probably about two years ago or so. Yeah, right? you're right. Three so, years. you know, that probably planted a seed in my mind. And so I went back and visited 10 year old Steve. And at that point, I was, uh, I was, I just felt so alone in life and scared. And so I went back and gave 10 year old, you know, skinny 80 pound me love. And it was really sweet and special. And so I visited with, I don't know why 10, but you know, that's a, I have theories on that. But anyways, <laughs> I've done that a few times. And so I did it one time where I actually saw my soul. And again, is this, is this just illusion? Is, I mean, who cares? Because I always thought of myself as a stupid person. And, uh, uh, you know, I really thought of myself as a stupid kid because I would just, there was this one corner where I worked as a crossing guard, had my sash and my badge. And I picked that corner because I was all alone no one else was there. And I would just sit there and cry the entire time. And when someone would approach, I'd wipe my tears and, you know, get them across the street. And, but so I went back and I saw myself and uh, I just saw rather than a stupid kid, you know, I was going through some shit and uh, I saw strength. Yes. And so, you know, I just kept having this thought that I am strong and then I went and looked in a mirror and I mean, you know, this is Hunter S. Thompson, crazy stuff, but looking back at me was just this full grown adult warrior. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I just really felt that that was my 10 year old 80 pound soul, just mm -hmm. strong and brave. And, you know, seeing that as my legacy, instead of oh, I was a dumb kid, I didn't know what was going on that really changed my self-talk. 
I mean, for the first time in my life, I really love myself hard and, and just a lot of respect for myself. And I carry that forward. My self-talk now is, is really positive, very patient with myself. That's beautiful. Oh, I love that. Well, this is why I want community. We can share these stories and give some ideas. Oh, absolutely. And tools too, because we all have had different experiences. And like you were mentioning, um, well, you know, in some of the other co uh, conversations today, you know, ego death has come up several times and kind of circle back with, with that and what you just shared. For me, ego death is, it's not the complete picture. Um, I think it's more along the lines of like ego reconfiguration because you know that when when you take enough of whatever plant medicine you're you know you're choosing to take and the ego death does happen um it's that's that default mode network gets to shut off and our normal autobiographical conversation gets to go quiet and then you it, it's cool because you'll get images of yourself or a space and time or someone else even sometimes too and your story and your narrative gets to change and you have this beautiful re-emergence like you said you now have beautiful self-talk or better at least and so for me it's like yeah ego death does it's that's one piece of the picture but the real thing is when you can re reconfigure and come out with a better narrative because that has happened for me too i actually ran away from home and you know this when i was 13 and the way I had told that story to a lot of people was kind of had some undertones of shame in it and just like yeah I know that makes me look like a rebellious kid I promise there's a lot more to the context and I would end up kind of bouncing around and feeling a ton of shame about it and um, at one point I was doing I, I can't I think it was LSD and uh, I was in Sedona and you never know what's going to show up for you when you're in these experiences. You never know. You cannot plan it. You can have an intention, but you can't plan what's going to come up from the subconscious, you know? And I had this really beautiful imagery come up of me being like this warrior ninja, little 13 year old girl. And I was like able to completely shift the narrative of, of having shame about that. I'm like, I am strong, you know, I, yeah. I, I had my own back at such a young age and look at how it's all played out. And it's a beautiful reemergence or reconfiguration. Like I was saying, it's beautiful. Yeah. And what I say, so I know Sarah's listening. Don't listen to this, Sarah. <laughs> she doesn't like when I use this term, but I think in many ways, psychedelics are more real than reality. Because I take your story. I do know, I do know your story and, you know, it, it's incredibly tough in your childhood. And so that is the accurate version, accurate, accurate vision is to see what you endured, what you went through, see where you are now. Only a warrior could do that. And so I think these things help us see things as, yes, the circus, the carnival, the dancing bears, all that. But then also we see some things really as they truly are. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. There's this quote by William Blake. I hope you don't mind if I look at my phone for a second because I, I wanted to, to read this. It's, it says, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear, appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through his narrow, narrow cheeks of his armor. So basically, I know I watched that a little bit, but basically, you know, the, the opportunity and the gift of seeing ourselves uh, with new eyes is, it's such a beautiful healing. I mean, I know a lot of people sort of anecdotally reference uh, plant medicine as, as therapy, but for me, myself, I've been through lots of therapy and I don't dismiss its beauty, but uh, the, the spiritual experiences and the ability to change some narratives and so on and so forth that I've had with plant medicine, just invaluable, invaluable. So it's, yeah, I, I love that we're having this conversation. It's just so important. I know how fun to have a group of people here talking about all of this. So William James is one of our great American thinkers on religion. And so he uses the word noetic and noetic experience. And so that's another word for spiritual emergence. And uh, what he says is that is an experience that is absolutely authoritative to the person who has the experience, right? That's something to guide them. 
uh, through their life, but no one else, it really doesn't have meaning to anyone else. And so you and I both talked about seeing our, going back and seeing ourselves as kids, we weren't stupid kids. We weren't, you know, we were, we were kind of brave and mm -hmm. that carries forward. And one of the great experience, one of the great noetic experiences I had um, was I saw, okay, so let me, on intentions, I really no longer go in and say, my intention is to do, have thus and such, because I think it limits the medicine. So I really, agree. I just- kind of, <laughs> Sorry, I emphatically agree with you. <laughs> yeah, so really, I kind of say now, I just want to see the stuff that's right in front of my face. <laughs> I miss. And so I had this experience where I saw, uh, it started with, you know, my youngest daughter, Lucy. Lucy loves the world she's always the safe person for me and i just saw her as i think she really is and mm -hmm. just godlike in there's not another word i can think of in english language other than rapture mm -hmm. just i mean i saw i i do believe we're 10 billion gods walking this earth i saw her then i saw sarah i saw all of my kids and i was just coming out of my skin how amazing they are hmm. and it kind of reduced me to a puddle like oh god i'm not i'm not really living up i'm not doing the things i should that was a low moment but i'm fortunate that the medicines always lift me up i'm like hey yes. okay, i get to be with these people i'm going to do better uh -huh. so to me that was absolutely <laughs> seeing god that was seeing the divine and i happened to get to live with those people that's beautiful, Steve. What a beautiful story. Yeah. So I say for the divine assembly, I say, yeah, I saw God. Now my God is Sarah in the kitchen. <laughs> now that would be weird if you folks wanted to worship her, but I don't know. Sarah. <laughs> into it. Oh, but what a beautiful gift. I mean, like you said, the medicines they do, they lift you up, but it's not all. I mean, it, I think it's important to note that it's not always going to be, we are not entitled to this euphoric experience it's sometimes going to be a little you know rough around the edges you know like but the willingness like i said spirituality for me is it's willingness uh, that's the main that's the main word for me when i think of spirituality but the willingness to go in and face yourself or face whatever comes up for you um that sort of lubricates the the experience and you, if you're willing to sit with maybe a negative thought or a negative experience or say you even see something that pops out of the art a little bit different you get you know freaked out and I, I i'm sure that's happened to most people the willingness to be curious about that um, and sit with it and face it is it's such a powerful tool um i mean i've had personally i've had experiences that I, at first I judged myself for having them, you know, and I'm bringing this up because just to touch on, you said medicines always lift me. Well, in the end they do, but sometimes you might have a bad, I quote, I don't believe in bad trips, but you might have a, an uncomfortable experience. And, but, you know, when you're integrating, when you're, um, when you're taking that experience into account and, and, uh, trying to find the alchemical gold, so to speak, uh, the lesson, the platitude, the takeaway, um, that, that rough experience can feel like a huge contribution. I've had two just this year alone. And I, I used to kind of maybe pat myself on the back for this idea that I always have this lovey euphoric sort of, I'm walking on the clouds and so connected to everything around me type experience. I used to always be like, man, I'm such a good, you know, a tripper. <laughs> No, I, I had this recently, I had two experiences where I had to kind of drop in and go to the abyss a little bit. And I did not expect that because I had prided myself on being so good at, you know, having lovey experiences. But it turns out that those were so powerful in, in my takeaways and how to integrate them into my life. And I had basically realized, man, I, I, to, to make it more personal rather than abstract, I'll tell you what it was, is um, I was in this experience and I had some mushrooms and people were around me and I probably didn't assess the set and setting as best as I probably could. <laughs> but I began to feel a sense of like fear and maybe, oh no, like 
I'm not safe and maybe even villainize a little bit in my mind. And I calmed myself. Nobody knew I was having this experience, but um, this happened twice in a row back to back where I, where my safety was, con I felt concerned about my safety. And I also felt concerned that, you know, th this person was bad and wrong. Anyways, the takeaway, I'm very close with that person that twice in a row, you know, I was villainizing in my subconscious and it made me realize I tend to do that as a, I think that's a narrative or a part of my brain that I need to look at. And like Carl Jung says, you know, if, uh, what's the quote that he talks about until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. So taking that into account, I say, I, I now catch myself when I'm maybe villainizing a little bit and, and, and just going into, I'm not safe and you're bad and wrong. You know, now I can just switch the narrative and say, Oh, I'm, that's probably a preset that needs to go away. I'm going to switch that. So it's powerful. The ne negative bad experiences can be super powerful. Uh, have you ever had any bad, bad uh, trips or anything like that that you want to touch Well, on? so so typically a good ceremony <clears throat> involves me dancing. Uh, the, the shirt always comes off, <laughs> hair just all over the place. Um, but there will be some part of that where there's just this gooey puddle of Steve all over the floor. And, and because I think I go through life missing a lot of stuff that's right in front of me. And mm -hmm. the plants, they help me see it. And then when I see it, it's kind of, well, it's harsh because I've missed it my whole life. But then they lift me. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you a specific on this. Um, so I've told you this and I've told Sarah this. Uh, let's just say I was massively connected to the universe. Um, you know, for most of this, this ceremony, um, then I realized how I'm not, how I haven't been connected to the universe. I haven't been connected to the people around me. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do some with my childhood. And, but uh, I realized that my entire life, I've only loved partially, mm -hmm. that I haven't loved fiercely. And so, you know, I saw the people in my life who need me to love fiercely and be fully present and that I'm not giving them what they need, not giving them my best self. That was devastating. I mean, devastating. And, uh, you know, I'm just like sobbing. And so someone in the ceremony just funk, I feel her chest, her head just hit my chest and she's just loving on me hard. And, um, you know, other people came over and, you know, they're just, they're taking care of me. This is why it's so important to do it in a good setting with good people. And so then, you know, I'm just sobbing, but I realized, okay, I see it now I can do better. Mm -hmm. And so Sarah talked earlier, those of you who've been on earlier, she talked about, she went in with a list of some things. And one of those lists was Steve, question mark. And so she, the medicine told her, well, no, no, she doesn't believe that. She realized in her mind, thanks to the medicine, she doesn't believe there's something external. It's all inside of us. Um, Steve is loving me as much as he can, period. It's not enough. Mm. She shared that with me at the time and, uh, you know, we're both kind of like, yeah, yeah, what do we do? That kind of sucks. And so for her, you know, what does she do? She has a husband who, who doesn't love her fiercely. Um, what, what should she do about that? Go through life with a husband who doesn't love her fiercely or, you know, do we divorce? No, because we get along so well. And so I told her this experience and she reminded me that, and, you know, it, more real than reality it hadn't occurred to us well duh learn to love more fiercely you know learn to love more fully and so that's the project i get to work on i get to show up and be present and we're having a lot of fun with that i think steve like the, your ability to go back in time sort of so to speak and see yourself and change the narratives of yourself i think that's a really pivotal aspect of you being able to go forward and love fiercely because I think our ability to love others is matched by our capacity to love ourselves. And so some of those crappy narratives, they got to go, you know, so in order for us to be our 
most lovey gushy self, you know, so. You talked earlier about, uh, you drew a distinction between spirituality and religion. Um, I think I get that. I think everyone gets that. A lot of really shitty things are done in the name of religion. Yeah. Is, there, sure. is there a place where they overlap? Yeah, that, that intersection. Um, well, to be honest with you, I mean, I, like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's personal. It's everyone has their own takeaway. For me, where it overlaps is an acknowledgement that I am, I am a part of a whole and there is, the whole is bigger than me and I, I'm, it is me and I am it. <laughs> and yeah. I think that's where it over, overlaps because most religions have that theme of, of acknowledging, you know, something bigger. It's just that they also have some rigidity around how you can communicate with that, with that divine source or, you know, what are the rules, how to behave. And, you know, I just want to circle back on something Mindy said that she mentioned, you know, for her, and I love this, it's true for me too, that the divine does not withhold healing based on her behavior. And um, I think that most religions do not give out that permission slip of, you know, hey, you're perfect the way you are. And here's all the healing you could ever want. You know, it's like, oh, you've got to do A, B, and C. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. So, so Mindy, uh, she mentioned in her talk earlier that she likes to trip with me. So I think that's fair game. It, it's, <laughs> it's important that we not tell other people's stories in this space, you know, because we don't know how out other people are. But she talked about tripping. So I will tell, uh, she said she loves to trip with me because she's safe and protected. I love to, and I'm going to say worship. I love to have ceremonies with Mindy because she has seen so much in her life and her story is public. You should, everyone should look her up. Mindy Vincent, she's seen a lot. So she will not be phased by anything that I do. So, <laughs> uh, so I was just on one couch, she was on the other. And so I was just like, Oh, <laughs> really getting into this. And so I said, Mindy, I said, Mindy, good Lord, I'm dilated to a 10 over here. And you don't even look over. And she, she still didn't look over. She says, you do you, boo. Call me. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's so, because when you are in that state, you've got your own things that you're working on. That's funny. That is really funny. Yeah, yeah. That's, an, that's an important part of the thing. So Sarah, Sarah doesn't like uh, being with other people when she trips. I think someone else in the chat said that um i do because i like the communal thing but also it's an opportunity for me to learn to tune out other people at times i mean i'm easily distracted by what someone else is doing in life mm -hmm. so it's just a good opportunity for me if someone is giving birth right next to me <laughs> metaphorically or being reborn that yeah. i can just sit back on the mat and just do my work Yes. What they're yeah. doing doesn't involve me. It's just an excuse for me to distract myself. Yeah, my that's true. If that person doesn't really need my help. Good to have that balance. One of my mantras is soft heart, strong back. So yeah. that, that ability to, to like say, that. oh, I'm going to sit here and do me. That's, that's beautiful. But I actually appreciate doing it with other people. And everyone has their own, their own way. But for me, it goes back to something I learned along the way about this concept called peopling and it's it's kind Wait, of say that again you broke called, up it's called peopling this concept called peopling um or you could even say mirroring but it's this idea that i'm not who i think i am i'm not who you think i am i am who i think you think i am and so in in i know that's kind of complicated no, it's, but it's the start no our idea. brain creates a model of self based on what we think that other person thinks we are or jean paul sartre yeah yeah yeah, and so in with all that in mind, I get to experience different aspects of myself based on putting different people interfacing with different people. And so it's a it's a deeper still type process like, oh, OK, so that's a different aspect of me. I wasn't sure. of. And truthfully, you know, we're all all of it. But uh, <laughs> but shaking up the snow globe of the ego is it's it's delightful. And so it's and it's so much information there and so much uh, power and in, in the willingness to do that. That's why I think, you know, this 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 topic is is for the courageous. You do not come to 
journeying and in, in, in the world of plant medicine without courage and without willingness. And I, you know, you can't, I, I, I just, everyone I know who is experimenting with all of this or incorporating into their life, they're some of the most thoughtful, heart led, um, self attuned people in the world. And I'm just honored to be among them. So, yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. So earlier you mentioned Carl Jung. Um, I, I had, which by the way, it's amazing to realize he never did psychedelics. Yeah. He says he never did. People around him swear he never it's did. So someone would know and, and Adam if he did, but the insights he had, it's phenomenal. So his thing, you talked about being part of a bigger whole. His thing is the mandala which which i didn't even i hadn't read young i didn't even know what that word meant until i had ego death and so i've had several experiences that to me it's beyond so where i get the noetic experiences where it's authoritative to me i'm i'm conscious i'm there my mind is working right i'm working through some things i see some things but i've had these things of ego death where it's like blank screen where all I see, and every time I see this this mandala, mm -hmm. and it is the most peace and calm I ever have, but which this is a very Jungian thing. That's what he says: is you're the center of it, and mm -hmm. that's the universe around you, and that's exactly what I feel. That I'm just this very small, insignificant thing, as Gabe said earlier, when he thinks about going way out in the universe and looking back at himself, but I am part of something amazing and that is everything. That's all I need. And so I have no words to describe what happens in that space other than it, it is healing and it, you know, Oh, so healing. If I could describe God, that's what it would be, but I can't describe that. But you'll notice the logo of the divine assembly is a mandala. That's the, oh. man, the mandala that I see. That's beautiful. That, I, I had no idea that's where it came from. That's so awesome. For me, I don't know, I, I just, I, this conversation is so important, but another, another thing I wanted to mention, you know, under the umbrella of spirituality is, you know, us Westerners, we tend to have a sense of entitlement <laughs> about most things, especially if we pay for them or if we're investing our time in them. But I want to kind of touch on what I believe to be true is that um, this plant medicine journey is a stewardship. And I believe it involves a lot of reciprocity um, and mutuality with us and the plant itself that we're that we're consuming. Um, I believe that it's a symbiotic relationship that when we consume the plant, um, if we do so with a commitment to self uh, evolution or self healing, um, that that reciprocity is immediately elicited because I think that is the intention of the plant. I mean, I know that. I, there's a beautiful book where I gained a lot of this uh, insight. It's called When Plants Dream by Daniel Pinchbeck. It is so relevant to this conversation that we're having. But I believe and I've experienced that. It's like a, it's a stewardship. So when I consume uh, any type of plant medicine, I do so knowing that in some way or with the intention that in some way I'm going to elevate my own personal consciousness. And I believe that that's how I reciprocate and show gratitude to that plant for what it's doing for me. So to me, it's a stewardship. It, it, it's not a recreational party thing. I mean, you can have a lot of fun. And boy, does joy, joy emerges. I love the shroom giggles. Am I the only one that gets the shroom giggles? No, no, no. Like there's, there comes a point in your journey where just everything is hilarious and you just see just you cannot stop laughing. I've had like just tears of joy just pouring down my face. Oh, the, the uh, medicinal quality of laughter is just amazing. But anyway, yeah. I got off on a tangent there. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I had an experience just recently where I was uh, walking through a canyon with someone and uh, the leaves were changing colors. And so at the same time, you know, of course, I don't know exactly what she saw, but I saw something and we both freaked out and then could not stop laughing at the show we saw. It was a, yeah. So that was, again, that was part of a night where, yes, I wept. I learned a lot of stuff, yeah. but 
but yeah, I had the had the mad giggles. I just have this. Uh, for me, it's it's this idea that whatever comes up from the subconscious or from the three D world around me is supposed to come up and it's supposed to be experienced. And when you're open hearted and you're willing to be curious about what shows up for you, you know whether it's something that's hysterically funny or something that's alarming or whatever, it's a it's all a very beautiful thing. So I just love the shrimp giggles. <laughs> They're my fave. <laughs> well, we talked about some fabulous experiences that we had, um, you know, while we're tripping, and that's great, right? To give ourselves that relief, that kind of insight, and but if if we stop there well that's kind of a shame right because a lot of doors are yeah. opened and so earlier um stephanie and mindy talked about integration yeah what does integration mean to you what do you do for that well for me that's actually the most important part and and that's it for me typically i mean the most potent aspect of integration is probably about a week out from from the day it happened to about a week after where i'm really integrating um for me integration means uh, looking at sitting with um and being present with what showed up for me while i was in that experience and kind of uh mindfully excavating that uh data so to speak or that um that experience so that i get everything out of it because if you just have the experience and you leave it there it the goal is is from how you take away and all the excavating that comes after it. And so integration for me is simply the mindful engagement with an experience. And uh, I, I don't wanna say make it pretty, but you can make anything pretty, so to speak, if you're, if you're uh, viewing whatever shows up for you as a contribution to you, you know? And so, uh, yeah, integration is, Oh, I needed, I needed to see that, you know, like Carl Jung, you know, whatever, uh, if, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. Well, something came up. It was uncomfortable. I've had repressed memories come up, things that I did not want to look at, things that I did not want to see and, um, integrating those back into, in, into my experience. Um, you know, the takeaway is beautiful. The takeaway is always that I'm, loved, safe, held. I might need to make this adjustment. I might need to change this narrative. Um, but I, I feel so guided. I feel, I feel less alone than I've ever felt in my life. I've started doing plant medicine probably, uh, I wanna say I started, I'm 37 now. So I probably started when I was 32 maybe. So about five years of this work. And I feel, I just, that if you've got eyes to see the magic is everywhere the love the support is everywhere so mm -hmm. and i and i attribute my eyes to see so to speak a lot to this this work this plant medicine for sure so yeah yeah that's what uh that was one of my latest revelations is because again i want to see what's right in front of my face yeah <laughs> that i look past i always think it's out there no the answer is right close by um, I just wrote down, uh, love is all around me. Mm. Uh, that is my fuel. My tank is full. Let's travel. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm. Oh, at one point I had this experience where <laughs> I don't know if this falls under like ego death or, uh, or just a, an anomaly of an experience, but I had this experience where I could hear this sort of whistling and a suction-y sort of a vacuum-y thing going on and it felt I, I got became out of body it was the weirdest thing and um you know I, I had a little bit of fear I'm like my soul is going to get sucked away into the cosmos <laughs> like what is happening I'm not coming back get in the body you know get back in there it sounded terrifying but it was the coolest thing ever because when I you know got back into I mean just for everyone to know I I do like I, in my dreams, I lose the dream a lot. So this is not a common thing or an uncommon thing for my soul to pull this kind of thing. But anyway, um, I had, I had this beautiful takeaway from that experience. And, um, I don't know if, if, if you guys are familiar with the story of Lot and his wife getting cast out of, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. And she was told not to look back. And if she did, she'd get turned to salt. You know, uh, I had this, after that experience, I had this beautiful epiphany and I wrote this poem called turn me to salt 
And that poem came from this longing to be me right now, all the mess, all the gunk, do not take me away from this beautiful experience, okay. you know? And so you can have a scary sort of thing happen. And, you know, the, it, like I said, the power is in how you integrate those experiences. So sometimes yeah, you get a poem, but sometimes a joke is, you know, but yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have, you know, a friend, a confidant that you do this, these substances with so you can just bounce you know hey this happened what do you think and you know i love that that uh i have people in my life you know you and i swap stories even though you have never tripped with me yet <laughs> um but yeah to have sarah uh just so fun to you know we know where each other has traveled to and that really helps with the integration and i love what stephanie said earlier that if we have an experience and then just go back to our routines and don't change anything then you know we've really kind of denied the power of these substances absolutely i fully agree with that you know and uh yeah there's so much there's so many conversations to be had under this umbrella of spirituality and plant medicine but you know it's just such a beautiful it's such a beautiful conversation uh oh i wanted to share this because there's probably a lot of people out there that I don't know that have that have tried it or are thinking about trying it. Um, but I don't know exactly who the audience is that's going to be watching this. But there's a, a there's a quote I want to share by Terrence McKenna um, that might be a little bit inviting if you if you're thinking about doing it um, at some point. I believe this quote could be very helpful. So I don't know if you guys know who Terrence McKenna is, but just so many beautiful contributions to to the world of plant medicine but he says nature loves courage you make the commitment and nature will respond to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles dream the impossible dream and the world will not grind you under it will lift you up this is the trick this is what all the teachers and philosophers who really counted who really touched the alchemical goal this is what they understood this is the shamanic dance in the waterfall. This is how magic is done by hurling yourself into the abyss and realizing it's, the, it's a feather bed <laughs> by uh, Terrence McKenna. So that courage that comes from facing ourselves or consuming plant medicines and kind of having to interact with the subconscious or the external world requires a lot of courage, but you know, we're held there's, it's a feather bed, so to speak, you know, and, in, in so, so many beautiful ways, um, plant medicine elicits that knowing, so. Well, I was thinking of Terrence McKenna earlier when you were talking about these plants and our bodies just really kind of being made for each other. He does a great yeah. job. Of, yeah. He does a great job of describing, well, of course, we evolved with these plants. They're, they yeah. are part of who we are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, love what he, I love what he says about um, ego. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but nope. just bringing him up again about ego death. Um, there's that moment in, in a plant medicine journey where you become what you behold. Meaning if you're listening to a beautiful song or in a beautiful landscape, that emergence, that uh, synesthesia, so to speak, you, it, it's that beautiful uh, melting into everything around you. I, his work is great. He, he's... Yeah, one of my favorite words for those who don't know, synesthesia is where our senses blend and so we end up with far more than five senses you know we can taste color we can smell music it's a neat thing it is beautiful absolutely oh well i'm trying to um, see i'm trying to see if we're, there's anything else that we might have left out of the conversation but we so I, have, I have one more top i have ahead. one more thing and then gabe probably has a question or two for us um i just wanted to hit on uh integration again i had so part of my trauma as a kid you know family was a little messed up and uh when i was like five my my big brother committed suicide and uh you know his room was one of my sanctuaries where it was kind of safe from the things that traumatized me and so uh, at his funeral we played let it be in long and winding road he was a big beatles fan and uh, I was in a ceremony and we were in the afterglow. I thought it was over. I'm just, you know, laying on a buddy's chest and 
uh, all of a sudden the people who were doing the music, they stopped playing their own music and turned on, turned on a playlist and it was Let It Be. And I fully mourned my brother in a way that five-year-old me never had. No adult ever talked to me about that. And uh, his buddies told me he had shot himself. His buddies, you know, did all this. And so, you know, there's no way for a five-year-old to really process it. And so, you know, you can't stop there. That opened some things. And I got some insights into him, my mom, my dad. But that's something that I continue. You know, I carried that my entire life unprocessed. So that is something I continue to talk about with Sarah and with others. And it comes up and, you know, I, I need to go probably talk to a therapist and, you know, what, what other lessons are out there that a licensed professional can help unlock. Absolutely. Yeah. On that cheery note, Gabe, what do you got for us? <laughs> well, we've got, we've got one question from David who, um, he actually asked us, about 30 minutes ago. So I hope he's still around asking, waiting on this answer. He said, I find a lot of spirituality to be dogmatic and prescriptive. Also, I see a lot of people using spirituality as an escape from reality or as a way to dodge dealing with shit. Mm -hmm. How do you keep spirituality from being a crutch and or a replacement from reality and finding your true self? I love this. I, uh, I think a question. I I, can I comment real quick? Because I honestly, like, I think that's a very valid point. Um, I think they call it, there's another word for it, spiritual bypassing, you know? And uh, it's when it's when we use the all the love and light and the spiritual dogma to make things pretty and to not sit with and own how we're really doing, how we're really feeling. And so that's a, for me, the antidote to that is, is willingness. Again, I keep talking about it because it's a theme. It's it, for me, it's a, it's a teaching. It's a really important theme. It's the willingness to feel what I'm feeling. And I don't always have to make it pretty and, and, and anything like that, but it's this, it's this idea of, of like another, I can't remember who else was talking about, but wholeness, like I'm, I'm a human, I am a human being. And that comes with some really negative, dark, uncomfortable things at times. And if my propensity is to always make it pretty and light and fluffy, then I'm missing the experience. That's not why we incarnated. That's not why we're here. It's to feel the whole spectrum. And so when you have a willingness to embody what, what it is that you're feeling, then you're not playing over there in that extreme that I think David was talking about. So yeah, and so, you know, I'll, I'll share, I'll answer that question by sharing with you why I started the Divine Assembly and how it is set up. Um, you know, I agree with the question. I think the religion most often comes with a lot of hierarchical top-down dogma. Mm -hmm. And that dogma is used to control others. You think about most religions, someone had an experience, right? Someone had a noetic experience where that person believes he or she, usually he, too many white men in all of these spaces, um, had an experience. And maybe a few early acolytes had some experiences, but then everyone thereafter has to subscribe to those experiences, right? When, when followers of that religion commune with the divine, the divine has to look exactly like the founder said it, right? So it's, it's prescribed what they can see. And so the way the divine assembly is set up, there's one tenet, which is that we each can commune directly with the divine. <clears throat> we believe that the psilocybin sacrament can help with that. So that's it. If, if, if Ashley, if Gabe, if everyone out there can commune directly with the divine, why would you care at all what Steve thinks or says? Why would you care at all what my experiences are. My experiences are for me. Your experiences are for you. Let's build community, get together and talk about them. But it's built along, you know, like the mycelial network where there is no center. Um, you can pull out any one part and it continues to sustain and support each other. So that's the point of this is to build community where we're all equals and all can nurture and support each other. That is so beautiful. Thank you. You're doing big work with this, and I'm proud of you. Love it. Well, 
thanks. I think this is a fun opportunity to build a uh, healthy, strong community. So actually, I don't know if you were on at the start, but Camille Johnson uh, was our very first presenter and she has, she has never done psychedelics and, you know, doesn't feel a need to at this time. And so uh, I love that she participated and that's where I think the divine assembly you know, could be a great thing if it's set up to where it's not just people who get together and, you know, do mushroom sacrament and have these crazy stories. And it's if people who aren't doing psychedelics at all, if they feel, yeah, I see something there that's healthy, that's nurturing. I want to be a part of that. Yes, that's beautiful. And, and personally, I think, you know, we should be able to get to these mystical states of consciousness, like you say, through drinking tea, like hanging Oh, absolutely, yeah. Prayer, meditation, song. Yeah. Ritual, I find, helps too, you know, having a ritual. Yeah. It amplifies it for sure, but yeah, I love that. It, I love the open arms uh, aspect of what you just said. It's not just for this particular type. It's But the, the tenant, having that one tenant of reinforcing that we can communicate directly with the divine and here's a modality but there's that's not the only one you know we can all agree on that i know i can <laughs> so yeah um let me see so yeah I'm, i just want to talk about one thing about sincerity of belief uh, kelly talked about that earlier uh so i think part of that direct connection rather than me the founder or any member saying here's what members need to believe what they need to do. What I've done is I've just drawn up a credo for myself just to govern Steve Urquhart in my particular solution. And so, you know, that is something that I think people could do to show the sincerity of their belief is this is what I do. Psilocybin in communion with the divine have helped me reach these conclusions about my life. Here's how I have, here's how I am bettering myself. So I'm glad that she brought that point up. And then also, like Nicole said, that we need to uh, get together with a tub of puppies sometime. <laughs> I did see that. I was like, well, sign me right up. 